Krishna, shall we start? Ready? Vishnu? Yeah. Yeah, I'm starting. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, am I audible, Vishnu? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Rahul Sadish, uh, um, and now I'm the secretary of IEEE Press, SBC, and ITC. And now IEEE Press, SBC, and ITC are arranging various webinars uh, and all. And uh, each international lecture series is on uh, our uh, prestigious event from the January itself, uh, January 2022 itself. And we're conducting every month on international lecture. So uh, yeah, today uh, our topic is the deep learning application for power system. And we are in uh, arranging events in association with IEEE Plus Kerala chapter, IEEE Plus OP Kerala, and Department of Electrical Engineering NATC, and the Industrial Power Group NATC. And uh, today uh, we have our speaker, uh, Dr. Vishnu Vishnu Sudesh, and he uh, received his B.Tech in Power Systems Engineering from the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun, India, in 2014. Uh, he received his MS degree in Control in uh, uh, Electric Power Engineering from uh, Rockla. University of Science and Technology, uh, Rockla Poland in 2016. He completed his PhD in 2021 and is currently working as an assistant professor in Faculty of Electrical Engineering there. And uh, he worked as a guest researcher at the Center of Research in Microgrids at uh, Alberg University, Alberg, Denmark from 2020 to 21. And his current research work is based on sustainable government, government development and uh, goal seven on clean and affordable energy under which he is designing uh, energy management system for microgrid and tiling the use of deep learning based forecasting algorithms and meta heuristic hybrid application algorithms and uh, he is a member of ieee from 2019 and has reviewed uh, scientific articles related to microgrids and renewable energy forecasting for iet renewable power generation uh, I, uh, IEEE, IEEE IZ conferences and uh, IMDPA energy, elsewhere, sustainable energy technologies and assessment uh, and assessment uh, and other uh, uh, well reputed journals and uh, he also has external ex experience working in several national international projects concerning multi energy storage hubs and forecasting concerns in solar PV outputs and load demand and uh, here, here uh, we are with the topic uh, uh, deep learning application for power systems. Uh, you can take the roll, uh, Yeah, thank you. Can you share the okay. screen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think my screen should be visible about now. Yeah, it's visible now. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Rahul, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to make this uh, international lecture with uh, the IEEPS from Kerala. So uh, let's dive in. So today I will be talking about uh, deep learning applications for power systems. We will not only be uh, looking at forecasting, but also we will be looking at other areas where uh, it's making an impact or you know people are looking at it for research uh, my name is vishnu suresh as he introduced and this is my email id so in case of any questions any uh, research collaborations and so on please um, send an email i'd be happy uh, to reply and oblige so just a small information about the university where i'm from um, since uh, I believe it is important. Um, so the university is quite old, established in 1910. We have numerous faculties. It's a large university with more than a thousand PhD students and it's one of the top technical universities in Poland. And as already introduced, I am from the faculty of uh, electrical engineering. We have many different departments. Uh, I am mainly from uh, the department which is related to power system analysis and nowadays we are uh, very much into forecasting uh, because of uh, renewable sources of energy in the grid and these are some pictures uh, of the university itself um, okay so the first question is why do we even need to talk about deep learning in general and why do we need to talk about deep learning in you know electrical power systems so if we will you know go to science direct if you will go to the web of science make a small you know analysis with regard to the number of papers being uh, 
published in you know the deep learning area or in case of the electrical power systems you will see that it is quite popular amongst researchers uh, it very clearly helps us you know ascertain any kind of a nonlinear relationship between inputs and outputs and that kind of gives us um, a weapon in order to understand phenomena which is um, you know uh, quite difficult to linearize and make assumptions with. so uh, in general the papers with deep learning have increased tremendously and you can see that for electrical power systems also it is increasing in a uh, similar manner so uh, when it comes to power systems, where do we use deep learning? So uh, I mean, we can pretty much use it in, in many, many different places, almost everywhere. Uh, but taking a closer look, you can use it for energy management and optimization. Uh, you can use it for you know, uh, characterizing or uh, you know, identifying power quality disturbances. Uh, power system state estimation, so it is connected a bit with energy management and optimization. Uh, we use it for energy forecasting, so in case you have um, wind generators, you have solar generators, you want to participate in the electricity market. It is very important to know how much your generator will produce, let's say a day from now, or even an hour from now, so depending on uh, the functionality. Uh, the same for the load forecasting. So if you are, um, let's say, a distribution system operator, if you are, you know, uh, a transmission system operator, you're always trying to forecast the load so that you can plan uh, scheduling of different generators in a good manner. And also it is used uh, in quite a different way in case of fault detection and classification. So in that case, the role of uh, these deep learning algorithms is a little different uh, but nonetheless there are a number of people who are you know uh, looking to research within that um, area so um, what does it entail so you know how do you put together a deep learning algorithm so uh, there are many different uh, there are many many different cases um, you know where you can I mean regarding what it includes so um, here I have a word cloud, so it you know kind of uh, puts together the most popular terms which are you know, associated with uh, deep learning. On the one side we have the applications. The one we are most concerned with, of course, is electrical power system research. But you know you can also use it for computer vision. It's the most uh, popular one nowadays for facial recognition. You use convolutional neural networks and so on. Uh, you use it for natural language uh, processing. You use it for translation of documents from one lang uh, language to another. You use it in, you know, social media finance for um, time series uh, forecasting and understanding uh, the time series relationships. Um, there are many different tools and platforms which we can use. The most popular is, of course, TensorFlow and Keras, but also there are um, others that you can use. Um, and uh, yeah, there are many different problem categories which we can use them. We can use them for classification, clustering, optimization, forecasting, and so on. So let's move from this word cloud a bit and let's talk about power system state estimation. So um, when we talk about power system state estimation, we we have numerous things that we can talk about yes we can talk about economic dispatch we can talk about dcopf we can talk about acof uh, acopf and the merit order curve now um, i'm pretty sure that a few of you do know the difference between each and every one of them but i can give a small um, overview of um, what they are and how they differ from each other so um, when it comes to the electricity market yes there are two kinds of uh, participants mainly so on one side you have the market operator so um, especially from the european context you know you have certain operators like Nord Stream, and then you have the local dso so what the market operator does is 
simply he uh, makes a forecast of the load demand of how much load it will be and then different generators and producers they participate in the market and the main objective of the market operator is to uh, ensure that there is uh, you know some kind of uh, some kind of a profit yes and once this buying and this selling of power is settled in the electricity market next you move on to the distribution or the transmission system operator okay and what he does is he takes a look okay you know what i have a bunch of generators who want to sell power is it technically feasible for them to sell that amount of power yeah. so that is what uh, the distribution company is checking because there is let's say there is a uh, you know uh, a wind power plant owner he has one megawatt of power he wants to sell the entire one megawatt okay so he goes into the electricity market he looks at the price he says okay you know i'm going to sell this at this time at this amount of the price now the market operator agrees to it because let's say that he's able to make a profit from this and then this order goes to the distribution system operator now the dso uh, he takes a look and then he says hey you want to sell one megawatt of power but then you're connected to a line which cannot handle one megawatt of power and that is uh, and that is the main job of the dso in order to make sure that the market participants act in accordance to the technical requirements of the power grid so in economic dispatch there is only the market operator we do not take into consideration any kind of losses and so on and then we have the dcopf um, this is the most popular one which is used by as far as I know, most of the system operators around the world. Uh, the DCOPF is a linearized form of the ACOPF and it is very you know, easy to run. And definitely within countries like Poland, Denmark and Germany, the system operator is running the DCOPF. In this case, um, similar to economic dispatch, we take into account who is uh, selling how much amount of power we balance supply and demand in the grid but then we also take into account how much power the line connecting different generators uh, and loads how much they can carry acopf is um, ac optimal power flow it's uh, one of the most popular topics for you know researchers um, it is a complete, um, you know, complete estimation of the system. On every node, you, you know, you find out the voltage magnitude, you found to find out the voltage angles, you find out the amount of loss that you come across on each line, and so on. But the ACOPF is actually quite um, demanding in, ter in terms of computational power, and it takes a certain amount of time to get the result. And even if you get the result, it doesn't ensure that you find the global minimum solution. Um, so it is uh, very researched very much and maybe in the future it will be used by the system operators, but uh, currently it's not being used. Um, so the merit order curve is, uh, let's say, uh, what it was being used in the 1990s and in the early 2000s for the distribution system operator to uh, you know match supply and demand so uh, on the right hand side of this slide there is um, there is a figure yeah i think you can oh, sorry yeah. so in this figure uh, we see here for example there is pd so pd basically represents the power demand at a particular amount of time and the DSO, what he has to do is he has to match this power demand um, in a way that he is able to make the profit. So he takes the cheapest generator. So let's say that in our case, G1 is the cheapest one. He takes all the power he can from G1. And then next, he goes to G2, takes all the power from G2. And then he's seeing that, okay, he still needs some amount of power to reach this power demand finally he goes to g3 he sees that he doesn't exactly need the entire amount of power from g3 only half 
So he schedules the third generator for half of its power, and then he's able to meet his power demand. Now, in the earlier days, what they used to do is, um, if he took half of the power from G3, this is called the marginal price, and this is the price in which uh, he's in fact selling. So, you know, he's kind of making a profit from the other generators. Uh, and this one is, right now it is not being used anymore, but from the historical context, it is good to know how this process works. Now, they use DCOPF, so which is balancing supply and demand, and at the same time, considering how much your lines can handle. So um, here are the economic dispatch and the DCOPF. So here I have a few formulas. I mean, of course, formulas are not a great uh, way for the presentation, but they're uh, you know quite simple uh, ones. So the economic dispatch is essentially a copper plate network. So a copper plate network means that you know everything is connected to everything else. Uh, you can transport power from one point to another as you want. There is no limitations. Um, the first uh, equation here, it is the objective function. So we have every generator and the amount of power it is producing and the amount of cost uh, that every you know generator is uh, using to produce their electricity. So given the cost coefficient and given the generator, the objective is, of course, to minimize the cost. Um, the first constraint that we use in economic dispatch, it says that PGI is less than minimum and maximum. So this basically refers to the, you know, the minimum limit and the maximum power limit for every generator. And the last equation, it simply says that the sum of power from all the generators should be equal to the total power demand. Now, these three equations, they are literally the same when it comes to DCOPF. There is only one extra equation uh, when it comes to DCOPF. This one, which we determine by the power uh, you know, transfer functions, is the amount of power that a line can carry. So every line has a maximum power rating. And while dispatching power from different generators, the uh, system operator is always checking that you know the line which is connected to the generator it can actually hold the amount of power that they're trying to sell okay so what about deep learning in this entire process so we saw dcopf and, and there are many different ways by which you can do dcopf i mean you 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 know, it is a regular optimization algorithms. You can use, you know, uh, meta heuristic algorithms such as Ant Colony, Particle Swarm. You can use, um, you know, the Newton Raphson method. You can use, for example, the interior point method. You can use, you know, n number of uh, solvers in order to uh, get um, the state estimation. Uh, but recently, uh, the physics informed neural networks, which is called PINs, it is being used for the state estimation. So uh, it is basically the use of neural networks in order to find the optimal combination of uh, generators to satisfy the load demand. Uh, why do we use, why do we have to use PINs? So one of the biggest uh, issues is the change in the topology of the power grid. Nowadays, uh, the grid is becoming extremely complex. You know, there are numerous um, owners of solar panels and other renewable energy generators. They connect wherever they want. And uh, we need, you know, a strong, robust algorithm, which is smart enough to quickly determine the combination of generators, which would give us the profit and which can estimate the power system in a really good way. So how do we do this? Um, in the middle section, you have the neural network. Uh, it has a number of activation functions. It basically you know, works as a black box. On the other side, we have PG. So PG is supposed to be you know, the power that is generated from all the generators. And 
here, if you take a closer look, you can see that we have PG cap and we have LM cap. Now, whenever we have an optimization problem, we have certain du dual variables which we need to solve. Yes. So what happens is um, we try to estimate these dual variables for the optimization problem using the neural network. And also, we try to estimate um, the output power for each of the generators. Now, when you give the input data, of course, um, <coughs> at the beginning, what you have to do is, in order to give certain training sets, you have to uh, have the optimal um, combination of the generators so that you are able to save your cost. And then you give those points as the input for your neural network. And what it does is it tries to minimize the error between this PG and this PG cap. And the lower the error, the uh, more robust is your neural network and is much closer to achieving uh, the state estimation that you want to. And the same thing is with the dual variables. Uh, and in this case, if you are aware of a neural network architecture, the most important is the loss function, yes? And it, it is inside this loss function that we embed this PG, this PG cap, and this uh, the dual variables and the estimation of the dual variable. And we will try to minimize the error of both of these variables. And at the end of the training process, you would see that it is able to uh, effectively um, you know, estimate uh, the state of the power system. Um, now, they are called physics-informed neural networks because um, we use certain physical characteristics. So if you look at the traditional, um, you know, traditional neural network architecture, we do not take into account any physics. But in this case, when we are estimating this PG and this uh, dual variables, we also embed these four equations. So when the error is being reduced, automatically these equations get enforced. So it is not a complete blind black box anymore. There are certain physical laws that are being followed when the loss function of the neural network is being enforced. And that is why we call them not only neural networks, but physics-informed neural networks, so that they're not a complete black box, but then they embed within themselves some physical laws. And this is very, very important because from the uh, system operator point of view, if you've ever spoken to them, they are never willing to use neural networks. You know, they say that it is a black box. We don't know what is happening inside. There is no physics-based explanation. If something goes wrong, how do we explain how it went wrong? Because the responsibility is very important for them. And this is part of the solution. You know, that instead of flying blind, we are now able to embed physical equations into the process. Okay, so that is about power system state estimation. Now, the next thing that we're going to learn is deep learning and protection. So there are a few um, things for which we can use them for fault region identification, for fault type classification, for uh, you know fault location prediction, and also um, short circuit power estimation. OK, so I got a question uh, what is the basic difference between conventional neural network and pin uh, just as i explained in the conventional neural network yeah um, when you're trying to reduce the loss function you are not including these equations which are um, characteristic for dcopf in case of physics informed neural networks inside the loss function, you will definitely include the physical law. For example, in case of uh, power system protection, uh, you will definitely include the Kirchhoff voltage law or the Kirchhoff current law when you are minimizing your loss function. So that is the difference. In the conventional neural network, it is only 
the error between um, uh, you know the predicted value and the actual value. Uh, no, no one in Europe uses pins now. It is in fact no, no, no. No TSO is using pins. Uh, only DCOPF. Pins is something which is being proposed right now. There are um, a few universities, especially Denmark Technical University in uh, Copenhagen. They use uh, pins. They're proposing it, but in reality, no one uses it. Okay. Uh, so the training is happening along. Yes, it is. The training is happening along with optimization. Okay, so let me come back to the presentation and I will answer your questions uh, when I can. Uh, so we use uh, deep learning for all these um, uh, things as well. Uh, so here is a small difference, you know, when we talk about deep learning and protection, we go into a completely different area of uh, time series data. So in terms when, when it comes to forecasting, when it comes to state estimation, uh, what we do is we have, you know, a huge amount of data and we try to predict each and every point. Yes. Now, what happens in protection is that we have a completely unbalanced data. So given, uh, let's say that you have data for the entire day of today. Okay. And let's say that there is one point um, uh, during which a certain kind of a fault appears. Now, for the other cases like forecasting, you will estimate every single point throughout the day. But when we will give the training data for fault detection, you will see that throughout the day, uh, you know, it remains a constant. There is no fault. The voltage value, the current value, all of them are quite stable. But there is only this one point during which there is a fault. And the neural network, how it will think is, it will think it is just an outlier, you know it will think that it is an exception. So catching that moment in time when something goes wrong, it is incredibly difficult. So the philosophy of you know, neural network becomes inverted when it comes to protection. But still, um, it is possible to use them for power system protection. Okay. Again. So um, how would you uh, do this? So um, what you have to do in this case is you would have to create uh, um, really good training examples. So you could use uh, any kind of uh, software. You can use PSCAD, you can use ATP, EMTP. You, you know, make your own uh, power system and you induce faults in different locations, different kinds of faults. You generate enough data with the faults, and then you train the neural network. Okay, so um, in this example that I have um, for all the different kinds of uh, faults, we have different, you know, a deep learning network for um, identifying the region of the fault, a different one for uh, classification of the fault, and the different one for fault location. Um, okay. So um, let's, for example, take a sample power system as uh, we have in this case. We have four different generators. We have uh, different uh, regions, let's say between generator one and two, and you know, in between buses, okay? Um, the inputs that have been used in this case are you know, the current magnitude, the voltage magnitude, and the phase angle of the current and the voltage. And given these inputs at every single bus and feeding them to uh, the neural networks, we definitely would be able um, you know, to identify when the faults occur. OK, so uh, moving on here, we you know, kind of uh, choose a small window of 10 seconds. Now, when it comes to power system protection, 10 seconds is actually a very you know, a long uh, time period. And let's say that uh, in this uh, diagram, the fault is in fact induced at exactly one second. And then uh, we will, you know, depending on the different application, we would choose a different window length. Uh, and we would also uh, choose what sampling rate we should use. 
uh, for example, in case of uh, fault classification and in case of fault uh, location, you see that for fault classification, we use the highest sampling rate which is available because it is quite uh, important uh, for that uh, functionality. Uh, but for fault location, we use, in fact, uh, you know, a slower sampling rate. Uh, because it does not affect our uh, calculations enough. Uh, much of this data has been arranged by, uh, you know, trying different neural networks, trying different sampling rates by doing some hyperparameter optimization and so on. So given these um, different applications, um, here I have, you know, a kind of a, a confusion matrix, and we can look at the performance of, uh, you know, the deep learning uh, algorithm based on fault region identification. So um, when we take a look at this, uh, you would see that um, it is not perfect. Yeah? So th that's the biggest issue. Uh, for example, when we look at uh, regions 10 and 11 and 5 and 6, so 10 and 11, 5 and 6 in this case are, um, you know, 10 and 11 is here, 5 and 6 is here. So in between these regions, they are regions more closer to the generators. It is able to perform close to with a 100% accuracy. Of course, in case of no faults, it's uh, performing really good. But in the middle of the transmission line, it's not as effective. It has only a 70% accuracy. So this is, in fact, one of the biggest problems of using neural networks for identifying fault regions. Um, researchers are trying to improve this, but generally, uh, this amount of performance would not be you know acceptable to any uh, system operator uh, but the story is uh, slightly different when it comes to fault classification because it is also important for us to know what kind of a fault has occurred on the line whether you have a single line to ground fault you have a two line to grind, uh, ground fault you have i don't know a three line fault whatever it is and you see that in this case no matter what kind of a fault we use, we have all the different fault types here, the accuracy is quite good. So in case you are using a relay, yeah, um, even though you may not want to use uh, the neural network for um, you know, the fault location feature, you can definitely use it for the fault classification feature. In fact, this was one of the things that I was doing as an associate scientist in Hitachi Energy. So we were looking at different areas where we could, in fact, apply them. And uh, we noticed that one of the areas where it is working extremely good is in case of short circuit power estimation. So even in a network where you have enough renewable energy sources, the neural network is able to you know identify the short circuit power in case of a fault very very accurately and in fact i mean now i work at the university but uh, as i was leaving the industry that was one of the things that they were looking at uh, very seriously and they wanted to implement and uh, what about fault uh, fault location once you know the region and once you know the fault type, is it easy to locate the fault? Um, it works in not a bad way. I mean, of course, uh, in even the conventional algorithms that we have in case of fault location, they're not perfect. Uh, but here, as you can see, for some faults, the fault location is really good, uh, especially for single line to ground fault, for um, you know two line to ground fault, it is uh, absolutely fine that uh, the error is, you know, it is constricted with a very, with a very small, um, you know, you know, level of difference. So it is between plus or minus one kilometer from your fault. Uh, in case of a three-line fault, it's definitely a big problem because it is, uh, you know, plus or minus three kilometers. So uh, the fault location uh, function is not working quite good in this case, but. Uh, as you see, we have uh, kind of mixed results when it comes to deep learning in protection. 
Okay, now uh, I think I have a question to what kind of a deep, learn, deep neural network is used for uh, protection? So I think you can use, I mean, it depends on what kind of, uh, you could use the normal neural networks as well. You can use LSTMs as well. So uh, I think it's um, pretty much um, up to you. Uh, for something like a CNN LSTM would also work really good. But uh, I, I guess it depends uh, more from you. Okay, so let's talk about solar power and irradiation forecasting. So the, the, the first um, question is why it is even important. Um, it is um, important uh, from the electricity markets point of view. Uh, it helps in uh, planning um, you know, the future generation. It helps the DSO to understand how much uh, load will be on the next day. It helps for unit commitment uh, problems. It also, as we saw, um, it helps in a number of things, even in case of, uh, you know, predicting uh, the reserves, you know, in checking the transmission line limits, if they will be exceeded or not. There are a bunch of reasons why forecasting it is important. And the most important ones are the load forecasting and the renewable energy forecasts, so wind, solar, and you know even biomass. Maybe. Okay, so um, when it comes to forecasting, there is a very important question: How far in the future do you wish to forecast? So that is what we call as a forecasting horizon. Okay, you can you know, predict one day ahead, you could predict 15 minutes ahead. And according to the World Meteorological Organization, uh, very short term forecasts is any forecast up to 12 hours. And for anything up to zero to six hours, it is called as now casting. Uh, I would like to say here that anything from, you know, even from five minutes to one hour to 12 hours, it is important because uh, we will look at the electricity market structure uh, in a few slides, and I will explain why it is important. But uh, multiple time horizon forecasting is very, very important. Um, if you will look at the International Energy Agency report, uh, they forecast the horizon according to intra hour, so within one hour, intra day, you know, six hours ahead, and day ahead, which is 24 hours ahead. Uh, right. uh, are any deep learning techniques used in practice by TSO or ISO? Uh, yes. So as far as I know, I mean, um, it is difficult to say if the TSO or the ISO are using it. So recently, I mean, just a year ago, we got uh, a project from the DSO in Poland uh, from our region, and we are building for them uh, a deep learning, you know, neural network based uh, forecasting algorithm. Um, the thing is that it is actually quite fast. Uh, the training, and uh, I will show you, it happens uh, within a few seconds. So it is not as slow as you would expect it. Uh, of course, cyber parameter optimization makes it quite slow, but once you're able to you know, identify the right um, um, right settings for your neural networks, it actually works quite fast. Yes, for the balancing market, the, the computation time, it matters a lot. Yes, if you're doing, let's say, a five minute ahead forecast, every five minutes, you have to, you have, to have a very fast forecasting algorithm, uh, but, from our experience nowadays, the deep learning network is able to do it. I mean, especially if your computer is really good. You know, in my laptop, it's able to do it. So if it's put in a server with a good computational power, it works even faster. Okay. So moving on. Uh, here I have um, an electricity market. So here is the case of Spain, and we will see how the participation works. So. Here we have uh, the DAM, it means the day ahead market, means 24 hours ahead. And here we have IDM, which is the intraday market, which is, which, you know, is uh, several moments during the day when the clearing happens, okay? 
so if you are a generator you would have to give a 24 hour ahead forecast that you know tomorrow you will be uh, producing a certain amount of power and then during different times of the day you would have the opportunity to uh, adjust them by a few percentages it depends completely upon the markets and um, um, as said clearing happens just a few minutes before and you need some forecasting algorithms even for 15 minutes ahead and so on um, for example the german spot market right now it's five minutes ahead so i think that's as fast as it could get so five minutes ahead forecasts and um, i have not heard i mean in research i've seen two minutes ahead but uh, in real life in practicality i've never you know seen them being used um okay so given um this market and given the day ahead forecasting and given the intraday for uh, forecasting what models do we use uh, so it depends completely upon the situation so if you are looking at something from 10 minutes to one hour uh, i mean uh, let's say point one hour you can actually use the persistence model you know so the persistence model is simply repeating the previous uh, output power so if you're a solar generator and you have to forecast five minutes ahead in time, you can just repeat your previous value. And more or less, you know, because the weather is not changing as dramatically always within five minutes. So more or less your error value is, will be within the acceptable range. Yeah? Uh, up to one hour, uh, you can use uh, conventional models. You can use ARIMA models. You can use ARMA models and etc. You know, even exponential smoothing models. Um, they work quite well. Um, slightly more than one hour, uh, you can use all your neural networks, uh, deep neural networks. But from my experience, I've seen that uh, six hours ahead, they start to fail dramatically. Uh, the sky imager is another short term um, forecasting model that you can use. So the interesting thing in this case is that you use uh, a camera you make uh, pictures of uh, the clouds and based on the cloud cover you're able to make uh, an accurate forecast um, when it comes to the longer term when you look at the day ahead or two days ahead or even one week ahead you have to definitely go to the numerical weather prediction models so in this case you have to go to the you know the global forecasting system the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, they give out, uh, you know, you know, forecasts for temperature, for solar irradiation and so on. Uh, and it is very good when you have, you know, one hour ahead, uh, one day ahead, you know, even one week ahead forecasting. Okay. So uh, in our case, we use uh, deep learning models for this. Um, in um, we mainly work with one hour ahead forecasts we don't go more we tried six hours ahead with this it completely failed uh, we are working on day ahead forecasts by using a combination of numerical weather prediction uh, forecasts and deep learning and in that case i think that we are looking at something promising um, what are deep learning models uh, deep learning models are neural network models which are you know much more complex and much bigger when compared to the multi-layer perceptron and uh, they train faster which is one of the advantages and uh, they are better than the conventional algorithms because uh, the conventional algorithms they saturate in performance so if you have an arima model if you have a some kind of a multiple linear regression model after a certain while you you can give it more data you can give it more computational power but its accuracy is not going to improve okay but in case of deep learning models the more data you give the more computational power you give the better it is able to perform uh, and in our case uh, we use something called lstms and in particular lstm autoencoder uh, we've also used cnns for this purpose but uh, this lstm which is long short term memory is the best uh, model when it comes to time series forecasting so uh, in the figure i have uh, two models one is um, 
wait a second. One is one is the simple RNN model, and the other one is the LSTM model. Now I think that you can just look at these two models and you can see that the you know the second one is much more complex than the first one. Um, what is the main difference? So let's take a look at it very very closely. So here we have the output, which is the output at the time t, and then we have the input at time t. Yeah. Uh, now what we do is we take the previous time step into account h t minus one, and then we propagate this output y t onto the next time step. So what is happening here exactly is we are trying to find the relationship between one time step and the next. So we are trying to forecast what will happen in the future based on what we've under, uh, based on how the relationship is between the past values and the values before that. Um, the problem with the simple RNN cell is that this uh, value here which is ht or ht minus one over a long period of time it gets degraded okay so uh, let's say you have um, 10 uh, let's say you have 10 uh, 10 minutes okay so we are able to find the relationship between the first minute and the second minute second minute and the third minute and so on between the ninth minute and the tenth minute and once we find the relationship between these time steps, we try to forecast the 11th minute. And with this kind of a cell, what happens is it will remember the relationship between the 9th minute and the 10th minute or the 8th minute and the 9th minute. But it will completely forget what is the relationship between the first and the second minute. So that is the biggest disadvantage of the simple RNN cell. And to address that shortcoming, the LSTM cell was introduced. And here we have two inputs. Here we had HT minus one. Here we have HT minus one and CT minus one. So HT minus one is able to remember the relationship between the ninth minute and the tenth minute and the eighth and ninth. And the CT minus one, it is the long term input. So it is able to I you know remember the relationship between the first minute and the second minute and when we go to the output now it is, the output is able to use both the relationship which was learned in the short term just a few time steps before and the relationship which was learned let's say 10 time steps before and that is why the LSTM is incredibly good when it comes to uh, handling time series data um, so Given the fact that uh, what is the usual size of the training data for these neural networks and practice, in theory it is told the more the merrier. Absolutely, the more the merrier is the truth. Um, so um, we actually have a ton of data with us. Uh, from my personal experience, um, four years of data where the data is recorded every hour is perfect. Uh, when I used one year of data uh, with every hour recorded, so it is 8,760 hours, it was not enough. Uh, if you have only one year of data, you might as well use a conventional model. It works better, but it improves. If you give it two years of data, it's good. Three years of data, it's good. Four years of data, it's also very, very good. But then afterwards, it kind of saturates in performance as well. So when I gave it five years of data, six years of data, eight years of data, nothing improved. But of course, the training time increased, you know, significantly. So um, you have to find a balance. In my case, I did it out of experience, and uh, I would suggest that it's the best way to find it out for you also. Okay. So uh, coming back to the models. So here we have the CNN LSTM model and uh, a regular CNN model. So, um, already, as mentioned before, uh, the LSTM model is very good in handling time series data. And the CNN model uh, is very good when it comes to identifying uh, spatial relationships. So, LSTM is good 
about understanding the temporal relationship, the relationship between time steps. The CNN is good in understanding spatial relationships, which means that if you have two solar panels located in slightly different locations, the CNN model, along with the LSTM model, is a very, very powerful forecasting algorithm. Um, and of course, next is the simple CNN model. So uh, these are different layers that you would have to configure to get your neural network model. Uh, in the end, we have the LSTM. So this one you already know. This one is the regular neural network. We have to pair it with the LSTM to make the algorithm work. The flattening layer and the max pooling layer, they are dimension reducing layers. So if you have a huge amount of data, the max pooling and the flattening layer, they actually reduce the size of your data and your neural network increases in speed. So it is very, very useful. And this is the convolutional layer, just like the LSTM, but for spatial relationships. And of course, you have the input data and the output data. Um, in this case, we are missing only the LSTM layer. This one is not here. The rest are the same. OK, so here we have 10 minute ahead forecasts. Um, I actually wanted to include one, one hour ahead also, and we have that uh, you know, coming. Um, in the next slides. So here I have uh, the actual ones are in the blue colors, the LSTM auto encoder, and then the ARIMA and the CNN LSTM. Um, you see that in, we have different days. So we have uh, these two days are from the summer. So we have in our university solar panels, which are of five kilowatt of maximum peak power. And uh, as I said, we have eight hours, eight years worth of data. So it is, in fact, very good for training these neural network models. And this one is more, uh, let's say, oh, wait a second. This one is more in the autumn or the spring. And this one is during the winter. So the output power is quite low. And you see that it actually works quite well. But at this point, I would even say that the persistence model would also work quite fine. Um, if you would look at uh, the evaluation metrics, um, the one of the things when it comes to forecasting is that everyone is uh, usually saying that they're not dependable, that they have huge variation in terms of errors and so on. So what we did is we ran the LSTM autoencoder model, the CNN LSTM model, a thousand times. And every one of these thousand times, we change the input data slightly. So we have eight years of data. And we just took randomly three years of data every one of these thousand times. And then we fit the models. And then we try to get the evaluation metrics. And then we saw in the uh, you know 95% confidence intervals that for the LSTM autoencoder, the error was between uh, you know, like 0.1 kilowatts to 0.3 kilowatts. So this is for a five kilowatt peak power panel, yes? Uh, so I would say that a difference of 0.2 um, uh, kilowatts is not as much. Uh, of course, the conventional model has a smaller range, so it's definitely more consistent. The LSTM autoencoder is less consistent, but still the spread of the error is not as high as you would violate any uh, any of your contract terms is because you have a plus or minus five percent of um, error of what you predict and what you supply um, so we see that the lstm is quite um, quite consistent and you see that the RMSE, the error here is 0.1 and the error here is 0.36. So it definitely is more accurate. The CNN LSTM is performing even better and has a smaller range. But the only issue with this is that it has a very long running time. So every time we did it, it takes 2 minutes and 10 seconds. The LSTM autoencoder takes about 37 seconds to be trained and make the forecast. So it's like incredibly fast. The ARIMA is, of course, the fastest. Uh, but still, uh, for a deep learning method, it's uh, quite fast. Um, for solar power prediction, you can use the LSTM, and uh, it should work quite fine. 
Okay, so this is more for the, uh, you know, for the uh, one hour ahead forecast. Uh, and here one day forecast, I've said it just means that it's for the whole day from zero to 24 hours. Um, you would see immediately that compared to this figure and this one, the error has increased significantly, yeah, because this is the blue line and none of them are matching it quite clearly. Uh, but in terms of uh, evaluation metrics, it still stays between 5% and 10%, something close to 6, 7%. Uh, that is the, you know, the error rate. So something which uh, we can work with. Um, it's for a summer and a winter time. But the most important thing to learn from this is the more you forecast into the future, the more will be your error. Um, and finally, I would like to speak about load forecasting. So we talked about solar forecasting, power system protection, state estimation, and the last one is load forecasting. So load forecasting is a is slightly more difficult uh, to do than solar forecasting because uh, the sun is still more consistent than human beings. So uh, we work with uh, industrial plan data and we see that between the weekends and the weekdays, there is a big difference. So whatever models we used for the weekdays we could not use it for the weekends we got huge uh, problems with the error and the other thing we saw is that year after year as the industry is adding more motors their electricity demand is actually increasing for example uh, going into this one um, I, it's a little hard to see but yeah okay so you see here so we measured the load in 2019, we measured the load in 2020, we measured the load in 2021, and you immediately see what the problem is. Yeah? You see that here we had around 260 or 280 um, kilowatts. We here, here we had 320 kilowatts, and here we had more than 400. This is because the industry is a dynamic uh, organism which is um you know improving as uh, you, you know they keep on adding more devices and this creates a problem when it comes to forecasting because the neural network is not able to capture um, this relationship over an entire year and of course you see that there is also a huge seasonal variation in the data but it is a little bit similar to the solar and here we have for the uh, for the winter for the summer and so on. Okay. Um, so in every one of these cases, uh, we used um, uh, we used a similar approach. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, in the previous case, we did not go season by season. In this case, we went season by season. So we had a separate neural network for winter, separate for summer, separate for spring, and so on. And we actually noticed that we ended up with quite less amount of data and when we tried to do the forecasting um, unfortunately our error rates were quite high i think we have to do a little bit more further research on how to in fact reduce them because uh, 50 kilowatts of error um, over you know 300 or 400 is quite high so uh, it is something that we are working on um, but maybe in this case, I think we would actually go, uh, I mean, we are working with some partners who are quite good with uh, conventional load forecasting methods and we are trying to improve them. Uh, but nonetheless, it is uh, something that we did uh, research upon. And as it was mentioned in the comments, with more data, I guess we would be able to perform better. Okay, and uh, what did we use for all our deep learning purposes? We exclusively use Python. And we used to use MATLAB for optimization purposes, but then we saw that Python is much more adept when it comes to forecasting. Uh, for data processing, we use scikit-learn, pandas, numpy, and so on. Deep learning models, we build them using TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, for data visualization, I mean, you could use anything, but Matplotlib, Seaborn, quite, quite good. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please do ask. Uh, I would be happy to answer them. Participants, uh, 
you can unmute your mic and uh, ask your queries otherwise you can uh, write in chat box i think you address all the questions vishnu uh, uh, i have uh, there are few more wait uh, i see is it possible to apply deep learning models for sister parameter identification yes it is possible uh, as i said the physics informed neural network is very good for system parameter identification and it's not only about the power grid it's about everything any physical process even if you're looking at fluid flow so um, the first paper that on pins was about uh, characterizing fluid flow and they embedded the loss function into the neural network so whatever parameters of any physical process you want to find out get the physical equations embed the equations into the loss function and you should be able to find the system parameters uh, the next question is is input uh, data should be of two dimensional or can be one dimensional also uh, it depends it can be one dimensional also uh, that you use only output power and then you forecast it based on historical values or you can have 2d also uh, because in our case we did have two dimensional data so we also took other variables such as uh, irradiation and ambient temperature so um, it works both ways 1d or 2d uh, uh, next one is wait wait since you mentioned that mm -hmm. is there any idea of data compression component of this? Yes, 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 yes. This is actually a very good question. So uh, in data pre-processing, uh, for example, principal component analysis quite works quite well. So there also you're using, you know, you're reducing the dimensions of your data. Apart from PCA, you can also use EMD decomposition if you don't want to go into the, you know, into the frequency domain. But also you can try wavelets for your, I think, um, Fourier is something that I definitely haven't seen yet with forecasting. Yeah? With forecasting, I haven't seen Fourier yet. But wavelet transforms, EMD uh, empirical mode decompositions, and also the principal component analysis. They are working good as uh, you know dimensional reduction algorithms. But it's um, actually it's a dimensional reduction algorithm, not a pre-processing, I think so. I said pre-processing, it is considered, but uh, how can it say yeah, pre-processing? Uh, how can I say again? A pre-processing method uh, because it's a transformation. I mean, yeah, it is a transformation method, but um, yeah, I mean you can call it pre-processing or you can call it transformation. We are more interested about what it does. Yes, it reduces the dimension of your data. And yeah, I, I mean, I'm, uh, reading on uh, there are some such techniques like uh, outlier detection, uh, some downsampling uh, that that. Card some, some sometimes called a pre-processing exactly the pre-processing method, uh, right? Uh, I, I, I mean, don't know. Yes, I, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Your I mean, data pre-processing is where you manipulate your data. Yes, and uh, sure, I mean, we can. I, I, I don't know exactly data. what what it means, uh, but but my concept is like that. Uh, it's some 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 sort of outlier removal or some damage condition absolutely. or something. Yes, uh, normalization of data, yeah, out, yeah. outlier detection, cleaning, all these are data, classic data pre-processing methods. And like you said, Fourier and all of them are data transformations. But uh, I mean, no matter what you call them, we are more interested about what's their effect and how good they're uh, yeah. able to improve your forecasting model. So uh, okay, okay. no one cares about the, about the name. Okay. okay. Uh, next, uh, a good, uh, please suggest a good on power system application based on DNN. Uh, all we've looked at is applications. So, you know, all we've looked at is applications from the beginning. Uh, for cybersecurity, I have got no experience with this, so I cannot answer that question. Uh, pin for price forecasting? Hmm. No, because uh, there is no physics behind human behavior. Yeah, so you can use the normal, regular, you know, LSTMs and so on for price forecasting. But pins, I have no idea what uh, physical parameter you could use for that. 
what do you mean by system parameter identification it can be you know identifying the voltage magnitudes uh, or the you know or the uh, voltage angle degrees at the you know different nodes of the network it could be identifying the you know the line losses and so on how do i select uh, the points for nonlinear system say with win system is it versatile with respect to operating condition or it has to be updated at each case uh, on power system stability studies so um, in this case it is a little difficult because you have to uh, for the nonlinear system you have to use the nonlinear equation and you have to generate um, points in order to train the network um, it has to be versatile so and it has to be updated for each case and then maybe you could see if it would work eventually for other cases or not but the more you teach it the more it would be able to solve your problem so having a versatile dynamic case is definitely helpful um, is there any relation between the number of hidden layers in the neural network and performance of the absolutely the more number of hidden layers you have the more bulky is your neural network and it is slower but it is also able to ascertain the complex relationships in a better way um, the other thing is that it could also lead to overfitting so with regards to hidden number of layers you would have to do some you know trial and error and to check how it goes open source model for solar forecasting based on deep learning yes please um, I mean you would have to build the model a little bit you know uh, because all this tensorflow keras all these models everything is open source including you know the pre-processing that would you you would do the data transformations that you would do all the functions are open source but you would have to put them together on the model uh, which is the easiest way to decompose the time series, like a trend, seasonal, or a random. Um, in case you have a trend, you can just use uh, the ARIMA models basics. Yeah, So they are quite good in identifying those. Um, in case of the LSTM, it is kind of able to understand the long-term dependencies in the time data anyways. So even without decomposition, it could work good. Um, OK, and in the last one, uh, wait, we have two more questions. What do you think about using ANN or a model with a known structure such as the ZIP uh -huh, to represent load in an energy management system for microgrids? Um, okay, so uh, I actually think nothing about this. It is something that you would have to check for yourself. Um, so I don't have a good answer to this question. Can we use CNN LSTM for signature analysis? Yes, I think it would be uh, really good for that. I think CNN is a good fit for that. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's all the questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah, is there any other uh, questions? Uh... A good book? No, not. I mean, I haven't. Not not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe the authors all together could write a good book, but right now there are only research papers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. is there any, any other questions? Um, yeah. write, write your feedback on our official mail ID. Uh, you can write uh, your humble suggestions, humble genuine suggestions. Um, I think we can wind up, uh, Vishnu. I think so. Yes, thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was very active participation from everyone. Yeah. And uh, anyone, if you're willing to work on research, please write me an email. I would. It would be my pleasure to work with you guys. Yeah. On behalf of IEEE plus SBC and ITC itself, uh, I would like to thank Vishnu uh, for your valuable time and all. And that it was also an insightful session for all of us and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you for all the participants for attending this session. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.